welcome. We're going to go ahead and start the January general membership meeting. Um, welcome. We've got three great topics tonight. First, we're going to have Steve Allen with Property Pond come talk to us about a new rental listing website that the UAA is a partner with. Uh, you'll be really excited to hear some of this, what he talks about. Uh, then we have Mike Travis with Rocky Mountain Power to talk about energy efficiency and how to save money um, on your uh, energy bills. And then last, I will cover the UAA lease. We'll go over all the different language, all the things you may not even know are in there, and talk about how to use it effectively. So we'll have Steve Allen come up. Thanks, Steve. That's a great crowd. I brought some cookies and carrots, but it doesn't look like there's enough for everyone, so you better get their back there quick. <laughs> um, uh, well, there's enough carrots, there's just not enough cookies. Right? It's always the way it works. My name is Steve. Uh, I'm with a company called PropertyPond.com. How many of you have heard of PropertyPond.com before? That's good, because we haven't been out until now. We're, we're actually launching our website on February 1st. And so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're very excited to be partners with uh, UAA. And, uh, and part of that partnership is being able to come in front of groups like yourselves and be able to kind of talk about this a little bit. What we are is we're a rental advertising website. It's, a, it's an opportunity for you to come and put your rentals on this website for free. And everyone thinks in their head right now, why is it free? Well, because we can sell advertising on it. It's an app-based model just like KSL and other free sites that you're uh, like you're advertising on. How many of you right now are paying to, to show your advertising on someone? Anyone? A few people? Um, how about Craigslist? A couple more people? All right, what about KSL? Everyone, right? How many of you do not have any rentals? Any vendors here? No? Okay. Um, how many people right now actually have uh, properties that are vacant or looking for renters? Great. Okay, this next little part's for you guys. We are having a promotion right now. On February 1st, when we launch, we want to have a lot of properties on there. So we're going to have a contest. We're going to pick one of the people that put their properties on our website and give them lower bowl jazz tickets. So that's kind of an incentive. There's not a lot of people that are putting their rentals on there, so your chances are really good because it's just brand new. We're gonna be putting a big campaign around it, but one of the best things we're gonna be able to do is we're going to be able to link this website, propertypond.com, with our parent company's website, which is utahrealestate.com. How many are familiar with utahrealestate.com? A few more people. That's the, uh, that's the MLS's website. That's where everyone goes. When I say everyone, we get about 250,000 unique visitors per month that go to utahrealestate.com. So we're gonna kind of be lending the power of that website and push it over here. We're gonna have for sale now, and then there's gonna be a for rent tab. And all those people that are going there to look for for sale properties are also gonna see a little for rent tab, and they're gonna be able to click on that, and it's gonna take them to, uh, to the Property Pond website. Uh, we're very excited to be able to offer this to you for free. We're gonna be working with big, complexes, uh, duplexes, and, you know, any size of complex that you have, or if it's just a one little house that you have to rent, we'll do that as well. Uh, how many people are realtors in this room? A few people are realtors. For those of you that are realtors, you don't even have to sign up. You're already signed up through utahrealestate.com or the WFR MLS. All you have to do is go in there, use your username and login for the MLS on propertypond.com, and it already has your information on there for you, so you're ready to go. Does if you're not... If you're a loan officer, you shouldn't have access to the MLS, so talk to me afterward. I'll get your name in. No, I'm just kidding. No, if you, have, if you have access to the MLS. Now, if you're a loan officer, normally you don't have access to the MLS unless you're a licensed agent. Uh, but if you don't, let's say you're not a, a real estate agent, all you have to do is go in and create a new account, put your name, your number, uh, that kind of stuff, and then you can put your inventory in there. Now, the best part I think about the, the, the new software is that once you put your property in there, it stays in there even after you rent it. It doesn't stay alive on the site, but it stays in your inventory. So that way when you go up for rent again, maybe in a year or two, you just click a button, bam, it's back up. Another uh, nice thing about the website is that it has unlimited photos. So you're not limited to just four photos anymore. You can put as many photos as you want. Very soon we'll have a virtual tour capability so that you can be able to do much more than just a photo. In addition to that, we have community. How many of you are, have a community that you're a part of? Nobody? A couple people. Um, so if you're part of the community, you can put the 
config tells all the community in there, and then you can say, well, I have three two bedrooms and one four bedroom, and you do all that, and then you don't have to list them individually, and you kind of take out inventory and put it back in there whenever you need it. So I, I really like that it's not, also it's not uh, based on when you placed your ad is where you're gonna show up. So in other words, you don't have to relist and relist and relist every day to be able to be that on that first page. This is what the, uh, a parcel-based system, a parcel-based system essentially means that we go off the address. No longer is it by random chance that you're gonna be up on the first page and how many other people are gonna list after you, or that you have to pay somebody or pay another company to relist your properties every day so you can show up on the first page of results. Because after somebody gets to the fourth page of results on some, on some websites, they give up because they've already seen so many duplicates, they figure it's just not worth their time. Now, we have a mapping system where they can say, well, I wanna live in this area, and guess what, if you're in that area, you're gonna show up. Isn't that a little bit better system than just happenstance? So we, we really like this. We think it's a little bit better mousetrap, uh, but we're counting on you guys to help us fill up the inventory, to be able to get that, uh, because after we put, push all this money to do advertising for it, if we get a lot of people going there and there's not a lot of in, inventory, uh, it's gonna be less, less likely they're gonna come back. So we really hope that you guys would go out there, check it out, it is free. Uh, we have a little pamphlet on here, and there's a phone number on there. Most of you guys have my card. If you guys came in uh, a little bit early, you guys have my card. If not, there's some cards and some more brochures in the back. And uh, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. Free is always great, but obviously you pay for someone else to pay. Right, and the, so it's an ad revenue model, just like uh, a lot of the free sites. So we'll sell advertising on there. And, uh, but the good thing is, we're not gonna sell advertising that's gonna go against you. Uh, somebody in one of our first classes said, well yeah, I pay, for, uh, I pay for a special spot on one of these other competitors of yours, and they have framed around my pictures, why rent when you can buy? <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a dirty little trick. So we're not gonna do that to you. We're gonna be doing things that are gonna be relevant, but they're not gonna be uh, counterintuitive. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah. When you say you're, a potential client would go in, punch in parameters, I think it. Yeah, how, how many of you guys have searched on the MLS? Okay, so you guys kind of get the idea of how people uh, do a search on the MLS. And that's the very, we have that technology already for the MLS, we're just kind of using it now for rentals. So you'll go in, you'll say, I want three bedroom, two bath, no smoking, pets allowed, you know, uh, promotion this, that, that. We have all these different parameters. Now there's only like about 12 required fields, but we have like 40 some fields that you can fill out. And the more specific you get, you're gonna be found in more results that categorize your property and what other people are looking for. So now you can type in a zip code, and they'll find everything in that zip code. You can put a price range in, it'll find those things in a price range. You can put in the number of bedrooms, and the more things you put in there, it's gonna narrow it down more. But you can simply go to our map and make a circle and say, I want everything in this area. And it's gonna do that for you. So there's a lot of different ways to search. Good question, yeah. Just a suggestion, I've already done this, we've encountered this with one of the other websites. Okay. Um, search for Salt Lake, say like Salt Lake City. Uh -huh. Search for Salt Lake City, it brings up some ads. But if you search for Salt Lake, it won't bring up both. Oh, Salt Lake City. So good, good way to do that. What we do to counteract that, though, is we kind of have a drop-down field. So it will, won't let you allow to pick Salt Lake City or Salt Lake. It'll be Salt Lake City. Okay. So that way it, it eliminates confusion. Good point. Great. Uh, we do have a little bit of history. We, we've, we've been going back to 1993 on the MLS, so we have a lot of this stuff worked out. We're just kind of lending that over to the, to the rental site now. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Is it statewide or is it just uh... great question? It is statewide. Uh, we have because of our partnership with UAA, we've been able to reach throughout most of the state already, and we have a lot of people that are committed to putting some rentals on there and so forth. Lucky for all the people in this room, rental you know vacancies are really down right now, so there's not a lot of vacancies out there. But uh, we do we do stretch out statewide, and we just signed a contract with Colorado. So Colorado, Denver Metro is gonna be starting to go on there, and we're gonna be taking this nationwide, and we're gonna be partnering with different associations and so forth across the country to be able to fill in that inventory. Why is that important? Because now, unlike a regional uh, really good website, if we become a national really good website, then people from New York or from Denver or from Las Vegas or wherever will now start looking on there for moving to Salt Lake, and then your ads will be found that way as well. 
So great question. Any other questions? No more? All right. Well, you guys have the information. If you don't, there's some in the back right there. Uh, feel free to call me if you have any questions. We'd love to have you on there. Again, for those that came in a little bit late, we're having a, a, a promotion. If you put your rental property on Property Pond before February 1st, which is our launch date, official launch date, we're going to draw for lower bowl jazz tickets, one lucky winner. And there's there should only be maybe 100 uh, different rental ads on there at that time. And that's still a lot. And I know when you go to other websites, it shows a huge amount, but that's because there's lots of multiple ads on there. But 100 rentals is a pretty good amount. So uh, you have a pretty good chance of getting uh, two lower bowl jazz tickets. So go jazz, and thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Next, I'm going to have uh, Mike Travis with Rocky Mountain uh, Power come up. And after Mike comes up, if there are those of you that are vendor companies, what I would like to do uh, is have you kind of come up, and we're going to give you 20 seconds each to tell us your name, what you do. And uh, as always, we encourage you, the members of the Apartment Association, to support our vendors, the people that pay dues every year, that contribute to our political action uh, committee. The vendors this year, I don't know if you knew this, they contributed over $15,000 to your government affairs, uh, plus the uh, almost $100,000 in dues that they fund this organization, plus the almost $100,000 that they fund the trade show. So we really do ask that you uh, give a give first opportunity to the vendors who support the association. So. Mike uh, is going to come up, and then after that, those of you that are here, vendors, can take 20 seconds and tell us your name and your company, what you do. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> How's everybody tonight? Good. Good. All right. Hopefully, we'll have a lively crowd. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Questions are always good because chances are there's five other people. When you ask a question, five other people in the room have the same question because it pertains to them. Just a little bit about me. I've spent the last 20 years in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Um, spent a lot of time uh, on the architectural engineering side in a capacity for, if you're familiar with the LEED program, energy efficiency and design. Um, I was approached by Rocky Mountain Power because I was going out and visiting with, with builders and developers and teaching them about energy efficient buildings. And Rocky Mountain approached me and asked me to come on board to do this, the same thing that I was doing, uh, only do it for them and teach energy efficiency for the, for the company. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, before we start off, how many are actual Rocky Mountain Power customers? Okay. All right, maybe I should ask how many are not? All right, I have a couple of hands. All right, great. Can I ask where you folks are from? Murray. Murray? Okay, good. <laughs> then I have some stuff for you too. So, first of all, what is energy efficiency? Okay. Maximizing your resources. Maximizing your resources. I have, I have participation goodies. Oh, yeah. So, so feel free to speak up. Saving money. Saving money. Okay. We'll go for saving money. I'm looking for a specific definition. Light bulbs. More than light bulbs, but I'll still give you one because it was a... Sir. Reducing overall energy consumption. Reducing overall energy consumption. That's great. Here you go. I'm a horrible throw, so if I hit somebody, please don't sue me. I think you'd have to find that mathematically. It would be the amount of output that you get divided by the input. Okay. Here, I don't want to throw. Let's go for the definition. Who wants to read that? Anybody? <coughs> Nobody? Energy efficiency <coughs> is using less energy to provide the same level of performance, comfort, and convenience. Okay, so we're using here. I'll even, I'll even toss you the participation goods. Yeah, so. sure, well, then I'll walk it over. Okay. Oh. Wow. So what our goal is is to accomplish the same tasks and functions as we did before, 
But what we want to do is we want to use less energy. So how do we do that? Right? To make better products. Make better products, okay. But before we get into that, why is energy efficiency important? Why do, why do we as the power company really care how energy efficient you are? It's cheaper to save energy than it is to create energy. Wow, that is great. Okay, I'll never get you. <laughs> it does. It costs a lot to build new plants. So basically, energy is a resource. Just like anything else, whether we use a renewable or we use some of our natural resources, it's still a resource. And the more we can conserve those resources, the better off we are. Both of it benefits both the customer and the utility, first by saving you money on your bill, because who doesn't want to save money on your bill next month? All right, somebody honest. <laughs> who doesn't? Who doesn't want to save money? Who wants to pay me more? Please? <laughs> I think so. Okay, it's also part of a sustainable energy portfolio, and basically it'll save customers money long term. But it also saves us money too. As was said, we don't have to build more generation facilities so that we can actually be the lowest cost. And because we are a regulated monopoly, I'll go ahead and say it. Um, we have to provide our customers with the lowest cost. And so we're charged with that, and we have to do that. And we have a really great commission that we have to report to you every year about how are we doing saving our customers money. So how much do we spend? Most of you are thinking to yourself, way too much, <laughs> right? Who's thinking I pay just the right amount? Exactly. So let's talk about where you are using some of your power in your home, in your units, and let's start to think about how you can do it. How many provide the utilities for their tenants? Okay, we've got a few. All right, great. So for you, this is probably even more important than, than those who don't. But those of you who don't, how many times have you gotten a phone call from a tenant that says, I am too cold? There's a draft in here. Something's wrong. My furnace doesn't work. And it never comes at lunchtime. When do those phone calls come? 10 o'clock at night. You're watching the news and the phone rings because you've got a tenant that's complaining about something. So what we're going to try to do is make your tenants a little more comfortable, save them some money, save you some headaches. So let's talk about some of the things where we can save some money. This right here in our lighting is probably the biggest thing. And I need to, uh, I need to address the disclaimer statement at the bottom, okay? These costs are based on a 1,500 square foot single family home, four people in the home. So prices may vary by location and all the yada yada, you know, fast talking stuff that you get on those ads. So here we are. And we look at this, how many of you have incandescent light bulbs in your units? <coughs> Quite a few of you. How many have just total compact fluorescents or CFLs? They start out that way. They start out that way? <laughs> okay. All right, the average, be, just habits, okay, we, we figure that between four, three to four hours a day is when the light bulbs are on, okay? With that, an incandescent light, $9.35 per month is what you're paying in your bill. Switching over to compact fluorescence, $2.84. There's a significance, a huge difference in, in cost. The other one right here is in your refrigerator. Your refrigerator runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and the meter just goes ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. How many of you have appliances that you provide with your units. How many of you have appliances that are older than 10 years? Okay, have we got programs for you? <laughs> the average refrigerator, 
right here, fourteen dollars and six cents per month. An Energy Star refrigerator, six dollars and twenty-eight cents per month. So we're going to talk about these tonight. So by now you're probably thinking, okay, great energy efficiency is wonderful, but where do I start? What's the best thing to do? Where am I going to get the most bang for my buck? Okay, there's a couple of things you can do. First, we're going to start out with some programmable thermostats. And I'll explain that as we go on. The next, we're going to look at some energy efficient light bulbs. Then we're going to talk about some Energy Star appliances. This last one, how many people have or manage units that have community facilities? Anyone? You do? Okay. I'll, I'll briefly go over this just because it probably doesn't pertain to most anybody else. Whoops. There we go. Occupancy sensors. Those are for if you have common areas that you want lights to go out that when people are walking around they can see, but when they're not, it automatically turns off. So, let's start with programmable thermostats. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, 45% of your utility bill is right here in air conditioning and heating. Okay? So, the best and easiest way to first start with energy efficiency is by adjusting your thermostats. How many of you have programmable thermostats in your units? Great. For the rest of you, I highly recommend it. You can get something that you can lock your tenants out of and you can set where they want until they whine at 10 o'clock at night and then you can negotiate. Paul will get into tonight later on about contracts and what you can negotiate for and how much you charge. Here you go. You can put that as one of your line items, I guess. But the average savings is 2% for every one degree. So if you were to set your thermostats just a little bit lower in the wintertime, and I know we're all going to complain because it's getting cold, finally. But it's cold in November. Well, it's, it's getting there. I, it, was, it was colder on my way up here. I watched the temperature drop as I got closer to Salt Lake. So, so that 2% can add up for, for those costs. Next is our appliances. So for those of you who have appliances that are older than those 10 years, this is where we get into some fun things. Okay, for participation treats, who can tell me the average lifespan of a refrigerator? 10 years. What did I hear? I heard somebody over 12 me. years. 20, 20 <laughs> We're getting close, but nobody's, act, I haven't heard anybody say it yet. 15. 15. 14. 14. Or what, what was that? 14. 14. Who said 14? Raise their hand. All right. 14 years on an average refrigerator. Whoops. There you go. Should we talk in older ones or newer ones? What's that? Are we talking older fridges or newer ones? We're talking refrigerators in general. There are some on the market that are, that if you've had for 20 or 30 years, that are still working, you're lucky, but most of them now are, are designed for about 14 years or less. I hate to say that. There are some on the market. Okay. So there's two price tags when you have to look at that refrigerator. What's the first price tag we look for? Price. Our price. All right. And then we get some sticker shock and we go, <gasps> I've got to pay that much for a refrigerator. But then there's the second price. Is how much is that going to cost me? over that 14 year lifespan of that refrigerator. How much do I have to pay? Again, those of you who provide your utilities as part of your, as part of that rent, this is a significant amount of money. Okay, so on my way here, I had a couple of minutes and I was, actually took a little bit too long. I decided since I passed the mall, I ran into Sears tonight to take a look at a couple of refrigerators. And so 
Luckily, I found two refrigerators right next to each other, and I looked at the price tag for both. One was a non-Energy Star rated refrigerator, the other one was an Energy Star. What do you think the price difference was? Double. Double? Not even close. Triple. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hundred dollars. About a hundred dollars. Wow. And you know what I found? The two that I was looking at, it was a hundred dollar difference, but it was a hundred dollars less for the Energy Star rated refrigerator. 22 cubic foot refrigerator, bottom mount freezer, stainless steel versus enamel, $100 less. Was it on sale? It was on sale. <laughs> but that's okay. Regular price difference, $325. Okay? On the average, an Energy Star, if we go back to that original slide where we looked at those appliances, we're talking about $108 per year in your operating cost difference, okay? So at $108, when you only have a few hundred dollars, what's your rate of return on that? 100%. What was that? 100% per year. For what, a year? Yeah. A little more, it's actually about three years. So at 100, at, it's, almost a, it's almost three years to do that because you're getting a hundred, it's a hundred and eight dollar difference. So you take that three hundred dollars, a hundred and eight, so you're almost three years. So if you're looking at that price tag, it's worth it to spend the extra or shop when it's on sale and save a hundred dollars and then it's immediate. And then furnaces, how many have older furnaces in their units? How many get your furnaces tuned up in your units every year? Okay, I'm hoping that I would see more hands, because that's important. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Typical furnace is 78% efficient. Okay, then you can get some higher efficiency that go up into 90% efficient. And then for air conditioners, for those of you who have central air conditioning that you provide in your units, the sear value is what you want to look for. The higher the sear value, the better efficient it is. Some of the other cost savings ideas that we have, because tenants call up and they say, I'm cold, I feel a draft, and what are we gonna do? What was that? Windows. Windows. What are you gonna do to your windows? How many have a budget to replace your windows? I didn't think so. Okay, so what do you wanna do? You wanna seal around your windows and your doors, all the cracks that you can find. You can actually feel some of that air infiltration, so you wanna seal those up. An inexpensive sealant, Home Depot, Lowe's, things like that will do absolute wonders. Tenants will not call you at 10 o'clock at night because they're cold, okay? There's some other things that you can do. Insulation's always great. Um, if you have the capacity to add more insulation, I highly recommend it. We do, we'll talk about that. I'm gonna skip occupancy sensors, but if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. I'm going to get to the most important one. And I save this for, yes? We have, I have a question. We were just at a seminar last night with G2 technology for mm -hmm. insulation. A new blanket they claimed that would save you 20 to 40 percent on your heating and cooling bills for okay. your utilities. Have you heard of that? What kind of a blanket is it? It's got mylar and... Does it, is it silver? Silver. And it's about, about... It doesn't have any 20 mil thickness. It yeah. doesn't have any insulation in it. It doesn't have anything. It's just a piece of, uh -huh. it looks almost like foil. Yes. Isn't it like a reflective? It's like a reflective. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will I will be how the. How much? Well, how is it installed? Well, they, it just lays they down just, over the top of your insulation. They just lay it on top of your insulation. Oh, they lay it on top of the so, what they tout. <laughs> Let's see, am I on camera? <laughs> I can actually say this because I actually did an experiment with that product. I actually have it in my own home. For those of you who are contemplating that particular product, I will tell you, it does not work. So, do not be caught up in the hype. Really? So. They had a pretty good demonstration. They had a great demonstration. They put the heat lamp down, uh -huh. and you push your hands with it. 
that's really convincing. Yeah. It doesn't work. Really? Yep. And I can speak, and I can do that from experience because I actually have that in my own home. And so I, I went through, and we did some calculations trying to figure everything out. And I was like, okay, it's not going to cost me that much to do this. So I actually went ahead and spent the money, and zero. There was no cost benefit for it. Your bills didn't go down half or anything? No. I'll give you your money back. What's that? So I'll give you your money back. Um, <clears throat> they're under a different name now. Really? <laughs> 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 like, what are the Business Bureau? I checked them out today, and I didn't see them in the Better Business Bureau. That's because they're new. <laughs> and they've changed their name. And they change their name quite frequently for that reason. So, how about the low E glass? Low E glass is absolutely wonderful. So, if you're going to put in your glazing, low E is absolutely wonderful. Great, it is a great cost savings to do it. There is, it, it's not snake oil for that one. That one's, that one's totally true. So, go for that. And I highly recommend, I highly recommend when you're replacing windows to go to the most energy efficient window you can and then do the low E glaze, especially on your south and west facing windows. So if you have, if you have some costs that you're worried about, <laughs> south and west are the two areas that you want to definitely add your low E glaze to. What's, it's fairly inexpensive to go low E versus standard glazing. Right now, I mean, there's really not that much cost difference. There's a lot of companies that it's sixes to do it. So I, I'd highly recommend it because of that. So let's talk about some light bulbs for a second. We talked about who has the compact fluorescence. I had a question the other night. This is my third night doing this. We were up in Ogden uh, earlier in the week. We did Ogden, Orem, and now tonight. Somebody had a question and, and they were talking about their compact fluorescence not lasting as long as their incandescent lights. I, I see a head shake back here. All right. How many have experienced that? Hey, how would you like to not experience that any longer? Yes. Here's the one thing light bulb manufacturers don't want you to know. Every compact fluorescent, because it is a fluorescent, has a burning time. So when you get a new bulb, you want to leave it on for about six hours. I know it doesn't sound energy efficient at first, but it is. Once you get through that burning time, those bulbs will last, as we say, six to 12 times longer. But there's a reason, and that, that's what you have to do. Okay? They have to be broken in. They have to be broken in. In the back. Also, they don't uh, do well in the large store. I wish they would. They don't do well in the large store. They don't. No, they don't. They weren't designed for that. For what? I just said. Garage door openers. So when you when your light comes on when your garage door opens, they, they weren't they were never designed for it. So I, <clears throat> these compact fluorescents, they have a, a ballast in them, correct? A built into the ball. A built in ballast. Mm -hmm. So I'm told if you flip it on, you go do whatever you're gonna do and you flip it off, it's not as efficient. It, it's wasting the bulb. Is that true or not true? Depends on the bulb. Energy star rated bulbs don't have that problem. Okay. It's your non-energy star rated ones that have the problems, okay? And so the nice thing is, is sorry. One thing about CFLs for garage door openers is they don't break. There's no filaments. They may not come on bright, but they do come on. If you're in there long enough, it'll be brighter. But it'll be good. Most yes. people don't live in their life in the garage. No, they don't. You have a question? Yeah, why have they all been discounted recently? Is there some kind of a recall on it? Or? No, actually, the reason was, or is, I should say, there was legislation that was pending um, to be enacted this year, uh, starting this month. Um, incandescent light bulbs were going to be banned. And so in some very hasty legislation um, in the fall, that ban nationally was uh, discontinued. So what we did as a company is we actually have a, we had, I won't say we have, we had, a rebate program so that you could actually purchase your CFL bulbs and then send a form into us and we'd actually reimburse you X number cents per per bulb. 
and it came up, I think it was, it was almost a dollar involved that we would give you. But rather than doing that, because people were buying them and complaining about the price, and it was such a hassle to do that, what we did is we actually invested into the market with light bulb manufacturers and asked them to, pr to bring those into the state at a discounted cost. And it was, it was more cost effective for us to do that than it was for you guys to hassle with some forms. And so hopefully you guys are taking advantage of that. Um, but with that, um, those, those bulbs, yes ma'am? So I just, within the month, went to Walmart and there were no incandescent bulbs on the shelf. And the clerk said, well, that's because we can't sell them anymore. So you're still telling me that's, that's not true. Now they can't sell them They anymore. can, okay. but there are a lot of companies choosing not to. Choosing not. All right, back here first, and then you. I just meant to say there was some company who just called their Walmart decided not to sell them anymore because these are so much more energy efficient. So. It's, I, I don't know. I don't know for a fact if that's what Walmart, Walmart is doing, but I do know that those are still on the market and you can still purchase those. So you had a slide earlier that showed the T12s, T8s, and I can't remember the other one, but these, these, I don't know what these are. T12s. T12s are going away, is that correct? They are. And T8s? Some T8s will actually go away too. Oh, really? There's a new federal guideline for fluorescent bulbs that meet, have to meet a, a certain efficiency. T12s um, with a um, magnetic ballast are done by July, I think it's 14th. I have a slide here somewhere. Um, this year? This year. And does Rocky Mount Power still have the rebates going on on these? We do, on commercial, for, for commercial buildings. We and do. how long will that continue? Um, until July 1st. Okay. Um, then that goes away because the bulbs are going away. You won't be able to do it. So if you're, if you're a commercial, if you do anything in commercial buildings, I'd recommend doing those now. T8s and T5s. Well, they fit there's a retrofit kit that you can get that will go into an existing T12 fixture so you don't have to pull the whole thing out, so you can do that. So here's that phase out, July 14th of this year. And so there will be a few that are on that market. I put that slide in here because of those who may or may not have community so centers that have those. purchase of these T12s, this? What's that? that no, these are these are like bulbs that go in, in here. In the commercial. In the commercial. Which I have. So to get that rebate, where do you get that out or how does that work? Go to whatsmart.com. Whatsmart.com? Mm -hmm. Okay. The other night we had some questions come up about some of our incentives. And so these are some of this is some of our residential incentive programs. There are some caveats to a few of these, so you do have to look it up. Again, you can go to wattsmart.com or rockymountpower.net. We'll get you to the same place, um, but more people can remember wattsmart.com easier. So, um, so that gives you an idea of some of the uh, some of the rebate programs that we have. For those of you not Rocky Mountain Power customers, those rebates are available for you as well. It's through UAMPS, and that's the, uh, yeah, forget it if I can remember what that is. But it's the Utah Association of Municipal Power Suppliers or something like that is what it stands for. Sir? Do you have literature handout? I don't. These are, this is our new, uh, this is a new booklet that we're coming out with. And those will be available uh, beginning of next month. So unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have any that were with me. But these programs, if you do go to wattsmart.com, click on our residential tab, and it'll take you to this same thing, and they'll explain those incentives a little bit more. <coughs> any other questions? Oh, I had a last summer. One of my writers called and said she was very astounded because her electric bill during the summer had jumped up a couple hundred dollars, which seemed like quite a bit. She probably has a 10-seer belt around 
2000 uh, AC, going to a 13 or 14 SEER, how much, uh, how much of that bill be reduced? <coughs> Uh, probably about uh, three to four percent, if not more, if you go into uh, a higher efficiency 14 or 15 SEER. Just three or four, in other words, eight or ten dollars a month on that. Uh, but also is going to depend, it's hard to, it's hard to actually give you a pinpoint figure because really it's going to depend on where that thermostat is set. Yeah. So, so really the, the biggest thing is, is that your thermostat settings really control more of that. We had a lady this summer who called complaining about her $375 bill um, for one month. First question we asked is, is, do you have central air conditioning? Well, yes, I do. What's your thermostat set on? 60 degrees. <laughs> First thing I want you to do is I want you to go to your thermostat and I want you to change your temperature. Oh, I can't do that. Yeah, well, if you can't do that, you're going to pay the bill and it's going to be that bill for as long as you do that. There is, there is a cost benefit to, to reducing the temperature on your, on your thermostat. In the summer, turn it up, 78 degrees is great. In the winter time, down to about 64. <laughs> Okay, then that's at night. So that's what about daytime? Daytime? Are you are you occupied? So maybe a little bit more. I would do too high. Sixty eight is great because it's occupied. So also I brought with me tonight and I'll leave I'll have copies on the back table for you. This is our book called Bright Ideas, and what this book does is it basically, everything that we talked about tonight is contained in this book, okay? So you can kind of get an idea, and it goes in a little bit more detail than what I've gone into, so I'll have these in the back tonight. I appreciate your time, and thank you for coming tonight. Thanks, Mike. Okay, this is where we have the vendors come up, so come on up. Uh, uh, Jeremy, you want to start us off? And 15, 20 seconds. Thank you. My name is Jeremy Wayman. I'm with uh, Mountain West Property Services. Uh, what we do is, uh, if you have to have the unfortunate incident where you have to evict tenants or someone just skips and abandons their property, uh, we assist you in going in and cleaning up the property so you can turn your units a little bit faster. Uh, another service we also offer during the winter months uh, is if you have vacant properties, we can also uh, work with you on some snow removal uh, during those vacant times to limit your liability there. So, um, Jeremy Wayman, that was Property Services, and uh, we're in the, the directories. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm Bob Taylor. I'm with Oregon Pest Control Services. That's pretty obvious what we do. We do the general pest control, your ants, spiders, and whatnot. But we also do some special things, uh, such as birds, such as bats, and uh, of course bed bugs. So feel free to call on us. Uh, we're in the directory also, and you know, I'll come to meetings occasionally. You're always welcome to call on me for free inspections. We have account managers like myself in the field which will come to your site and do an inspection for free to determine what your problem is and to give you some direction on what you can do, whether you want to do that on your own or whether you want to direct us to do that. So, for instance, on bed bugs. So we also do uh, education on what to look for on bed bugs. And birds are kind of a specialty, too, because birds can be a real problem. So yes, feel free to call on us. Oh, yes, and mice, rodents, yeah, inside and outside. What about pigeons? Pigeons, definitely. <laughs> Moves, definitely. So feel free to call on us. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're going to go through the UAA lease for the next few minutes. And uh, before I start, I want to remind you that every uh, so often we update this lease. Occasionally people tell me, you know, listen, Paul, 
My tenant moved in five years ago, and they're on the same lease that they were on five years ago. Is that okay? The answer? No. Why? Uh, laws change. The contract has to change to adapt to new challenges and to new laws. I'll give you a couple of examples. How many of you knew th three years ago bed bugs would be a problem? We didn't know. And so when the court started saying that uh, bed bug liability and for paying for the cost is all the landlords unless it's in your lease, we put it in the lease and now it's the tenant's liability if they bring bed bugs or cockroaches or things like that on the property. That's an example of something that changed. Uh, we also have a new collection law, which is very significant. Turn on the back, page three, that first clause, general, I'm gonna read the very last sentence. In the event obligations under this agreement or its addendums is assigned to a licensed collection agency or attorney, a collection fee of 40% shall be added to the obligation. So if I move out, I owe you $1,000 and I don't pay you, the minute you have that new collection attorney, if I have signed this new updated contract, you can add what? $400. And then the attorney is going to add $585 at attorney's fees, and they're going to get a judgment on my credit report of $1,985, of which the attorney gets half if they collect it. Are they going to be motivated to track me down and to garnish my wages and to stalk me until they get that money? <laughs> They are, and that's in your interest. So that's why you need things like that. Last thing that's fairly new, we have a clause in here on page four. Renter's insurance, you can make it required. Previous leases just said strongly encouraged. Most landlords in America now require renter's insurance for the same reason that mortgage companies and banks require liability insurance on properties to protect them, to protect the landlord, to protect the uh, um, um, mortgage company. So there are two reasons that you would require renter's insurance. One is to protect your tenant, okay? You care about them as a customer. If they have a loss, you want it fixed so they can continue as a customer, okay? Uh, I had a tenant uh, that called her landlord. Her landlord called me and said, Paul, I have to tell you about this conversation. I, I uh, started doing requiring renter's insurance. Uh, tenant calls me and we had a fire and was crying. She said, I just got a $21,000 check for my renter's insurance. And I was sitting here thinking, I never would have done this had not my landlord made me. And so I just wanted to tell you thank you. Without this $21,000 check, imagine the devastation my life would be in. But instead, the landlord took care of that tenant. Second reason is when tenants cause damage to your property, renter's insurance, we all know, covers the stuff in the property, right? Did you also know it covers the stupidity? <laughs> So a tenant leaves a candle burning, starts a fire. Whose insurance does that claim go on? The renters. Why would I put it on the owner's policy and have my rates get jacked the next 10 years when I have that, that secondary shield, the renter's policy, to put it on? Other common things are renters sometimes have old washing machines. Have you heard of this? And they have the, uh, the rubber hose and it breaks. Okay, why would you put that on your insurance? That's why you make them have insurance. Renters sometimes don't shovel walks. Someone might slip and fall. Why would your insurance cover that claim when their insurance should cover it because it was their responsibility, their negligence? So again, the, you ought to use every time uh, a, a lease comes up, the most modern, newest lease because it'll have the most protections and it reflects changes in law and in court interpretations, okay? So, turn back to page one, we're gonna start with the Top two lines say occupants. Line one, occupants over the age of 18. Line two, occupants under the age of 18. Why do we differentiate? The ones over 18 can do what? Sign contracts, the one under 18 can't. So we want to list everybody on there, and then what we say after we describe the premises, so under the box that says premises, we say, no other occupants other than the ones listed above shall reside in the premises. Occupancy by guests remaining over three consecutive days or five days in any calendar quarter will be considered to be a violation of this provision unless uh, prior permission by the landlord, okay? So does that clarify who's allowed to be there? Mm -hmm. Only those on the lease. If they move somebody in that's not on the lease, what do you do? 
a three-day notice, comply with the lease, or we'll evict you. And there's two ways they can comply. They can either get rid of Johnny, or they can do what? Have Johnny apply to be added to the contract. Why might we rather have three people on the lease than two? More money. More people to go after if there's a default. That's more people that have a judgment on their record, more people that that attorney can stop and can uh, garnish their wages till they get you paid. Yes, sir, question in the back. Yeah, that first person on the lease, uh, would we uh, have to sign a new lease or do you have an addendum to a lease? Good question. Do we, do we sign a new lease or just an addendum? Uh, if it were me and there was still room, I'd just add and uh, Johnny to the original lease. I would have them sign, I would have him sign on both copies. <laughs> So uh, you're welcome to do a new one if you want. If there's space, I don't see any problem using the existing. Sign and date, right? Sign and date. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes, though, people use this as an landlords use this as an opportunity to extend the contract. So we say halfway through the year's lease, you want to add somebody. Well, let's write up a new year's a new lease and do it for a year. You see how you use that opportunity to extend the contract. So that's up to you as well. Okay. Let's go over the rents and fees. Okay, your rent will be set on whatever the market will bear. Your late fee should not exceed 10%. So if you had a thousand dollar rent, your late fee shouldn't be much more than 95 or 100 dollars per month. Okay, judges typically do not like daily late fees. They feel like if someone's late on their rent, you should do what? Give them three days to fix it, and then follow the process. Don't nickel and dime people to death by charging them daily late fees. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what is a month-to-month -month fee for? Why? Well, it's to compensate you for the inconvenience of month-to-month -month or the risk of month-to-month. -month. If, if I've got a lease August to August and your renter decides to go month-to-month -month and moves out in December, is that risky for you? Yeah, you're going to sit empty a couple of months. So it would be better to renew the lease, and one great way to in incentivize renewing the lease is to say, okay, Sally, your rent's 700, but your month-to-month -month fee's 150. So if next August you choose to go month-to-month, -month, you're going to pay me a little bit more for that flexibility. And then before the lease is up, you say, Sally, man, we really need to sign another year's lease, or your rent's going to go up. If you sign another year's lease, we'll keep it at the same amount.